The honorary degree will now be conferred. Mr. President, will you present the honorary degree candidate, Eleanor Wachtel? Mr. Chancellor, to the countless Canadians who value the arts, Eleanor Wachtel is a national treasure whose informed conversations, infused with wisdom and sprinkled with wit, are as much a part of this cult country's cultural landscape as the works of the authors and thinkers she so graciously brings to our attention. Eleanor Wachtel earned a degree in English literature at McGill University and then set out on a journey that eventually brought her to Vancouver, where she quickly established a significant presence as a freelance writer and theater critic. As an editor of Room of One's Own, a groundbreaking literary periodical, she was also an influential figure in Vancouver's feminist literary community. And to Simon Fraser University's lasting benefit, she served for five years as adjunct professor in our Department of Women's Studies. In 1990, Eleanor Wachtel entered our national consciousness as the host of CBC's Writers and Company. From that moment until now, she has genially engaged us in her intimate discussions with writers whose works fuel our imagination. The authors whom she interviews invariably fall under the spell of her unique combination of erudition, curiosity, and grace. While in kitchens and living rooms, coast to coast, we are entranced by the unfolding conversation, leaning towards our radios in anticipation of the next question. The judges who recognized her work with the CBC Award for Programming Excellence spoke for all of us when they stated that if they had to choose one hour of radio to take to a desert island, that would be writers and company. From 1996 to 2007, she was also the host of The Arts Tonight, adding yet another dimension to our national dialogue about art and artists. Some of the finest hours spent with many of the most thought-provoking guests are preserved in Ms. Wachtel's two edited collections of her radio interviews, Writers and Company and More Writers and Company. To the delight and edification of her audience, she added a third work in 2003, Original Minds. For her distinctive contributions to Canadian culture, Eleanor Wachtel has been appointed a member of the Order of Canada, and she has received the Jack Award for the promotion of Canadian books and authors. Today, we pay tribute to this remarkable Canadian whose original mind has informed and enriched our lives. Mr. Chancellor, on behalf of the Senate of this university, I ask that you now confer upon Ms. Eleanor Wachtel the degree Doctor of Letters Honoris Causa. Eleanor Wachtel, by the virtue of the authority vested in me and in the Senate of this university, I hereby admit you to the degree of Doctor of Letters Honoris Causa. Ms. Wachtel will be hooded by Dr. Bill Crane, Associate Vice President, Academic. It is with pleasure now that I call on Dr. Eleanor Wachtel to give her convocation address. Dr. Wachtel? Mm. 
looking out at you at all these blankets, I feel like I'm in a utopian sanatorium. <laughs> Chancellor Brandt, Chancellor Brandt Louis, President Michael Stevenson, distinguished guests, faculty, parents, and especially graduates. It's really a great honor and pleasure for me to be here. I feel a particular affinity to, with Simon Fraser because I was welcomed here so many years ago as an adjunct professor. And Vancouver feels like my hometown in so many ways. It's where I began my career, it's where I met so many of my good friends, and it's where I love to come back to. It's hard to describe exactly what this feels like. It, it's, it's like some kind of a blessing conferred for what I scarcely merit. The American writer Russell Banks, um, blue collar, he wrote uh, Affliction and the Sweet Hereafter. When he got an honorary degree, he called his mother, he explained what it was, he was all excited, and she said, just like you, to get it the easy way. <laughs> well, you've all gotten it the hard way. I was looking at a recent New Yorker where they talk about how stressful an experience a university education can be. The competition, the relentless exams, the social pressure. In the US, almost half of the people who go to college never graduate. And there were a few other numbers I thought might interest you. For instance, the biggest undergraduate major by far is business, almost 25%, almost a quarter of all bachelor degrees, compared to 4% in English and 2% in history. What can I say? You are a select elite group. By the way, I tried to see if the same numbers applied here in, in Canada. I looked into Statistics Canada, but they don't group things in the same way, and I found myself lost in statistics limbo, which reminded me of the old math joke. There are three kinds of people in the world, those who are good at math and those that aren't. <laughs> but you are a highly prized cohort. The not obviously utilitarian education can be the best preparation for trying to make sense of the world, to question, to discern patterns, and make change. The saying goes that a university education teaches you how to think. I would hazard that you were already well able to think in order when you first came to this distinguished school. But what your degree gives you are choices of what to think about. It extends your thinking, taking you to new places and entering other lives. It's a life enhancer. A degree doesn't necessarily teach you how to make a living, it teaches you how to live. The Nobel Prize winning writer, the Turkish novelist Orhan Pamuk, who I interviewed a few years ago, said, I believe literature to be the most valuable tool that humanity has found in its quest to understand itself. Like Pamuk, so many of the writers I encounter talk about the essential value of literature, not in any self-serving way as writers, but rather as readers. For instance, the Canadian novelist and poet Michael Ondaatje, who said that if he had to choose between being a writer and a reader, he'd opt for a reader, that books are infinite and infinitely rich. And I remember the novelist Carol Shields saying that she never reads novels to escape not even when she was very ill, but reading for her was a necessary enlargement of her life. And here she touch touches on something I was saying earlier. What changes people, she said, is access to language and their ability to expand their expression of themselves through language. I remember that line from T.S. Eliot, I gotta use words when I talk to you. But what words and what worlds they open Carol quoted St. Augustine, who equated reading a book with having a conversation with the absent. In a sense, my work is double happiness, as the Chinese saying goes, having the conversation with the absent through their work, and then having a conversation with the present, with the author. When I put together a book about original minds based on a series of interviews I did with people who had made a difference through their lives and work, 
it made me think about what it means to be original. And two things in particular kept coming up, curiosity and risk. Curiosity as an appetite for the world and for the present moment, especially noticing the normally overlooked, the apparently unimportant, the undervalued, the negligible. I was struck by how often this came up from people who were otherwise so completely different. For instance, Jonathan Miller and Jane Jacobs. Miller is English, Cambridge ed educated, trained as a medical doctor. He became a comic performer in Beyond the Fringe. He made the television series The Body in Question and is now a curator, writer, and director of theater and opera. Miller talks about how he was brought up to believe that curiosity is what makes life worth living. Keep your eyes open. Life is filled with odd paradoxes and problems, and you have to not let things just run by you. Similarly, Jane Jacobs, who was the guru of cities, famous for her groundbreaking work, The Death and Life of Great American Cities. Almost 50 years later, this book still influences how we live and how we think about where we live. As Jacobs herself captioned the illustrations of the table of contents of that book, and the book has no photos and no drawings, she wrote, the scenes that illustrate this book are all around you. For illustrations, please look closely at real cities. And while you're looking, you might as well also listen, linger, and think about what you see. I began by talking about business. Let me conclude with money. Well. Canadian currency. The $5 bill features hockey. The $10 bill, a monument to the First World War. But the 20, and because of bank machines, probably the most common denomination, is about the arts. There are beautiful First Nation sculptures by Bill Reed. And then, maybe in five-point type, this from Gabrielle Roy, who grew up in St. Boniface and lived and rode in Quebec. Could we ever know each other in the slightest without the arts? I remember reading somewhere that if a language has a future tense, there's hope. You and what you are about to do are our reason for hope. I also remember how the Quechua speaking people of the Andes, the Indians, look at time different from the way that we do. We tend to view the past as behind us and the future ahead, as in, let us go forward into the future. The Quechua, more logically perhaps, recognize that the past is what's already known. It's right in front of you. The future is behind your back because it's what you can't see unless you catch a glimpse of it from the corner of your eye or out of across your shoulder. You can't see it. It's without limits. It can turn your head around. I wish you every success and congratulate you on your convocation. Thank you, Dr. Wachtel.